very good morning Mr Gandhi, do you really think that uh, someday we can replace the tangible uh, uh, certificates with blockchain technology like digital certificates for academic uh, performance of the students? Do you know there was a there was talk about blockchain, one of the sessions was on blockchain. It's a fascinating topic, everyone is talking about blockchain and every company is using blockchain as a buzzword. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to <laughs> you have to wonder if it's true or not that they're really using blockchain technology. Um, you know, my in my limited understanding, um, blockchain can be a powerful tool for securely encrypting things in such a way um, that you can rely on computer systems to completely replace certain types of systems which are currently still manual. So yes, probably it will be possible to have exam certification systems provided through the blockchain because it'll be completely secure in such a way that nobody can forge the document or, or cause problems that way. Uh, there is another option where if we somehow link your certifications with your uh, unique ID mm. that is the very successful, that is already successful in India, mm. right? So uh, that will be hosted on cloud servers yeah. and everyone will have their uh, qualifications and certificates exactly. linked to the UID. Yeah. That is a very different approach from blockchain. In blockchain you will actually have to keep the certificates in encrypted form at your machine. But on a cloud server linked with your Aadhaar number, that will be hosted on a government server and that won't be an issue for students to carry their certificates. No, blockchain is a little more, in my understanding, that it, it, it offers a little more than that. Yes, the, the, the storage is on one particular mm. location, but the access can be from anywhere. Yes. Um, so in that sense, I think it's universal. But frankly, you know, this is, it's a nice idea, but it's not one of my core priority in education. Because whether you give the certificate on blockchain or on paper, mm -hmm. it doesn't change the learning process. Right. You know, exactly. it, it's still the same certificate. Okay. So, you know, if we have to invest our energies in thinking about some change that has to happen, that's not my priority. <laughs> so, coming to the learning process that you mentioned, uh, do you really think that personalized learning is possible in Indian scenario? Yes, it is. Um, through technology. Technology can assist the teacher mm -hmm. to help with personalized learning. Mm -hmm. um, for example, there are some pretty sophisticated adaptive learning platforms now, mm -hmm. which use true machine learning. So the student can be sitting behind a computer screen, uh, working on, you know, working through some topics, answering questions, and while it, while the student is doing that, the system is itself learning about the learner. Mm -hmm. So it's learning about the student, and then tailoring the content according to that student's individual needs. So it's providing personalized content to help that student. So this is possible and then at the same time it's generating a lot of data mm -hmm. about the student and about the class as an aggregate uh, which the teacher can then use to inform his or her teaching strategies. Okay, great. So uh, you had this insights from that conference or you already had worked on this kind of things? Personally I like to keep very much in touch with what is happening in the okay. field. Okay. You know, I, we Apart from the Learn It conference we also visited the BET. Uh, mm -hmm. which Fair, which is the world's largest education technology mm -hmm. exhibition. So it's a huge, huge hall full of every possible education technology you can think of, thousands okay. upon thousands. And I had been there in the previous year also. Okay. Um, and apart from that, you know, I've been working to try to keep abreast of what are the latest developments. Okay. So Learn It has enhanced my understanding of how that can be implemented and how to uh, perhaps how to bring around uh, a cultural change that can enable that implementation. So you talked about the technology to use the personalized learning, right? So uh, these texts are uh, not very cheap, I think, and not very accessible right now. So uh, do you really think that uh, without these technologies that now rich kids are getting or will get in future, in near future, will poor kids will perform as well as rich kids? There is a danger in technology that using technology too much will enhance the outcomes for the people who are already doing better because they're rich right. and will leave the poor people even further behind. So we have to be aware of that technology, uh, that, that risk. There are ways around it. Um, now, for example, internet access has become pretty universal. Okay? Right. We could not say that even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Now there's 4G coverage pretty much everywhere, even in a developing nation like India. Right. Okay? Um, secondly, you know, these technologies are designed that they can work on pretty simple devices, okay? right. even on a smartphone. And we find that 
majority of uh, households in India will have a smartphone available. Right. So that technology is becoming more and more accessible, and the actual platforms themselves, the software, you know, there's so many in the market. Some might be very expensive, mm -hmm. others are completely free, and mm -hmm. they're also doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So actually that universability, universalizability mm -hmm. is there, okay. and, uh, and is important. And I think it can be scaled to the masses in a way that will improve learning outcomes for everyone, not just the rich people. Uh, we are drawing in uh, information but start for knowledge. John Nesbitt says that. Uh, now I wrote in current scenario that we are drowning in data but start for information and knowledge is forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> Schools are uh, concerned about smart class and high tech of teaching uh, methodology. Uh, what do you think about the data that we collect about students and teachers performance and the analytics that we can perform on them? Data can be a very powerful tool right. to enhance performance of teachers and students. Um, you know, there's a, there's a danger when we're using technology also that a lot of schools might want to just put it because it looks good, because it's good for admissions, right, exactly. you know, it's flashy, uh, and then it's not really being utilized to its best effect. Right. So the way to utilize it is to do it in such a way that it is a tool that assists teachers. Right, exactly. Okay? We can't expect teachers to change their practice overnight. You know, I'm, you, teachers are the people in the classrooms working hard on the ground to do really hard slog to get the kids to learn. I'm no one to sit here in an ivory tower and direct them to change their pedagogy like this or like right. that. But yes, I can provide them with tools like technology that can assist them with the process. So what can data do? It can solve certain gaps which have historically always existed mm -hmm. in education. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, the mastery gap. So there's this idea that um, you know, a student, we, you move on to the next topic once you've completed one topic with the class and everyone has reached a particular level, okay? Mm -hmm. So if the student has scored 70%, mm -hmm. it's not the best score, but they've passed, they've passed that topic, they've moved on to the next topic. So what about that 30%? They're not building on, you know, because each topic builds on the next, there will be some learning mm -hmm. gap, which does not translate to the next topic and the next topic, and they'll right. fall behind that way. So this is called the mastery gap. So how can you make sure that all students have mastered one topic before moving on to the next? That requires differentiated learning. It requires enabling students to work at their own pace. Everyone is capable of coming up to that level, but they sometimes need more time or more different learning methodologies. So te technology is that great equalizer that enables students to work at their own pace more, that gives data to the teacher to show how different students are doing relative to each other and can enable more targeted teaching mm -hmm. strategies. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't have any centralized system in our government which can analyze the performance of the students in different classes, different standards on particular subjects. Right? If we can implement some kind of centralized system to connect every schools in the government or other private sector, private school chain of schools, so we can collect the data on performances of the students uh, based on that. We can, but that data would be a very overview type of data. Right, exactly. It is not. It won't be data that can really inform individual teachers to change their strategies. Yes, yes. That aggregate data will give a general overview, mm -hmm. but that you know that's a could be a dangerous path to go down. Okay. Because you know when you're collecting aggregate data on that kind of scale, mm -hmm. then the nature of the data collection and the parameters upon which you are analyzing data mm -hmm. become very important. Right. Because, you know. So if if you have a a system which requires all kids to you know, learn in a particular way, mm -hmm. to rote learn loads of information, mm -hmm. then the data which is generated will be based on valuing that, valuing, valuing that, gaining right, of information. Exactly. And you know, you might see that some schools are doing better or worse, but you know, if, if, if that is not actually the most effective way to help children to really learn mm -hmm. and to really enable their understanding and to give them the cognitive mm -hmm. skills to thrive mm -hmm. in the future world, mm -hmm. then we're valuing the wrong thing. And we don't want all our data to be emphasized on something which is the wrong thing. You know? okay. So mass aggregate data can be a useful tool only in very general terms. Okay. Yeah. So actually mass aggregated data can be used in marketing uh, of uh, different products like uh, Walmart use it to uh, predict your purchases. Absolutely. Right? But that, that's a totally different, uh, a different sector, right? right. right. <laughs> but uh, we, haven't we haven't used data mining and AI technologies in uh, education sector. You said that it will be very dangerous if we have emphasized the uh, data analysis on particular type of learning, mm -hmm. on particular, uh, what do I say, 
I think uh, particular way methodology of teaching, mm -hmm. right? So we have to make a system which can solve the requirement of particular student, mm -hmm. which can perform the analytics on all the students, but can help out a particular students on analyzing the way he or she can learn. Right. So there, if you have these types of softwares that I was talking about, right. these adaptive personalized learning softwares, if they have very good artificially intelligent programming, mm -hmm. prop, true machine learning, okay? Right. And I mean, there, there are multiple ways of, of mm -hmm. making adaptive learning. One is simply that, you know, if, if the student answers a question, mm -hmm. if they give this answer, it takes them to that question. If they give that answer, it takes them to that question. Right. So it, it's a tree. It, right. it divides them and that is adaptive. Mm -hmm. But the really advanced and best adaptive learning systems have proper machine learning. Now that is very technical, I myself, I'm not going to pretend to really understand how that is programmed, mm -hmm. but basically it means that the artificial intelligence is learning about the student in a more sophisticated way mm -hmm. than simply just passing them on based on a tree. Okay. Now, the artificial intelligence improves its quality and its accuracy when it has more data to feed upon. Okay. So if, if thousands and, and lakhs of children are on one, using one such platform, mm -hmm then actually the AI will improve more That's what I was talking by about. aggregating so much data from yes. so many people. Yes. That is probably better off in that remaining in the hands of the private sector because it has to be combined with so many other things. It's right. not purely a data mining tool. Right. You know, it's, it's a content tool, it's a learning tool, right. it's a uh, personalized analytics tool for the teacher. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, that's not something which is good to give to the government. But yes, more and more kids coming on these types of platforms will enable these platforms to improve through big data. Right. So, uh, what's your view on the importance of data analytics and access the performance insight of students and teachers? How important uh, is maintaining the data of students in well-organized way? It's just uh, normal tech. Not I'm not talking about AI or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about uh, how important it is to maintain the normal uh, the conventional data that we collect from students. Conventional data. Right. Very important, um, especially as a lot of schools are growing larger and larger, so there's a lot of students to manage. Mm -hmm. um, it helps with the security of the child, with the administration of the school, um, and you know the, the smoother the administration of the school, the better, mm -hmm. for two reasons, mainly. One is that it means less time of the principal and the teacher goes into administration, mm -hmm. because they can concentrate more on teaching, mm -hmm. which is what matters. And two, it usually means the costs come down, so the parent has to pay less. Right. So it's important to have as smooth administration as possible right. through good you know, ERP softwares and, and that kind of thing. There are two tech that we were working on. One of them is RFID card attendance system when we are implementing in a school. And the other one of the, one of my friend works in NQ space, mm -hmm. co-working spaces. So a startup here there has developed a system where they can take attendance with normal CP plus or Higgins cameras installed in your classrooms. So do you think that these kind of technology can implement it in future? Like if we want to change, replace the conventional RFID card system with a camera system. So what will it do? It, it will take the attendance of all the students who are attending the class first. Then in the next phase, it will capture the emotions and uh, uh, behavior of the students while the teacher is teaching. So it can assess the performance of teacher in the classroom. Do you think that it would be a good thing to um, test it out or implement? The possibilities are endless. Okay. And there's a lot of exciting possibilities as okay. well and there's a lot of dangerous possibilities as well. Right. We have to strike the right balance. Right. Okay. You know, the right balance between, for example, the security of the child mm -hmm. versus having too much overbearing monitoring of the child's movement. You know, you mm -hmm. can track exactly where a child is moving every minute right. but sometimes you know, I, you know I'm not sure that's good for a child's well-being and development right right exactly. okay so similarly you know you can you can start installing all these cameras in classrooms and everything but you don't want to create a surveillance state okay, okay? you know a teacher needs to yes you can you can perhaps infer something about the teacher's performance based on the emotions of the children mm -hmm. first of all I think that technology to be accurate is still a little still irrelevant still a while away several right. years it'll take you know, even Google has not got uh, very accurate 
uh, emotional recognition technology, right, exactly. facial recognition. Uh, we have achieved the attendance system, but we are working on uh, emotional recognition. Yeah, yeah. Is. So to have true emotional recognition is going to take, a, you know, let's see if Google can do it, then, <laughs> then let's see if anyone else can do it. You know, right. <laughs> Actually, most of us are using the APIs of Google Vision mm -hmm. uh, and the Amazon recognition. Yeah, but even right. those systems are not yet up to that mark. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, secondly, you know, even if they are up to the mark. There's a lot more to assessing a teacher's performance than simply the emotional state of the child. Right. So we don't right. want to bog, get bogged down too much by individual parameters. Teaching right. is such a broad field. There's so much involved in it. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes if every child in the class is upset because mm -hmm. <laughs> because the teacher is making them work really hard on something which is urgent and the course has to right. be completed, sometimes the teacher is doing the right thing. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? So. Anyway, we you have to have the right balance. Yeah, you have just tested the nerve. <laughs> <laughs> What's your suggestions to uh, school owners, other school owners in India? Suggestion, right? <laughs> just you are uh, running the largest chain of school here in Lucknow, and you are a well uh, reputated in, in national or international level. So, what's your suggestion? Well, you know, it, it's my. Uh, my, my family, my nana nani who founded this institution and who mm -hmm. built it up. Mm -hmm. And whatever I've learned from them mm -hmm. is that, you know, if you want to uh, grow and expand and be successful as a school, uh, they have, I guess, two, two main things in that, in that arena of development. Mm -hmm. One is that, you know, they have always genuinely run it for the love of the children. Mm -hmm. It's a non-profit organization. Right. They get a modest salary and nothing more than that. They have published their assets online. They live, you know, in a very modest condition. If you go and mm -hmm. see, in fact, my, you know, my grandfather, his his desk and his bed are in the same room. He lives mm -hmm. within his office and mm -hmm. just wakes up, works, sleeps. That's it. He doesn't do anything else, okay. and he doesn't have any personal wealth. So that is one thing. Doing it out of pure dedication and love for the for the teaching and the right. and the learning of students. And number two is that you know when it comes to. Uh, so-called business strategy, I don't want to call it that because mm -hmm. it's a non-profit, but you know, in terms of trying to grow and expand your organization, mm -hmm. just they just focus entirely on quality. They don't think, okay, such and such a school is doing that, so we have to compete by doing something. Mm -hmm. it, they don't see them, it's not about a competition. Right. It's not about competing with schools for admission. You just be the best that you can, improve the quality as much as you can, mm -hmm. and then people will notice and they'll send their admissions to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Gandhi. It was really nice to talk to you. Pleasure so, talking with you too. <laughs>